Good morning. It is great to see everybody chatting this morning. And we've got Ed Honeycutt sit down. So. Really like to welcome everyone this morning. And if you have not silenced or uh, turned off your, your phone or communication device this morning, we'd appreciate if you went ahead and doing that so that it won't interrupt you or someone around you this morning. Also, we have two nurseries. One is in the back of the auditorium here, the one just out the back uh, door here to my left, uh, to the office to the right there, Terry's old office. If you need to use either one of those, you're more than welcome to. I'd like to welcome all of our guests this morning. We've got several visiting with us, and we really appreciate that. We've got one really, really special individual here this morning. I'd like everyone to be sure and, and meet her before uh, she gets gone. That's my great granddaughter. <laughs> here for her first time. So we'd like to uh, be sure that everyone stays around so that we can get to know you or you can get to know us at the end of services. If you've not picked up a communion pack, uh, if you would raise your hand, we'll be sure that you get one. Uh, here we need to give Bob his Sunday morning exercise. He's getting a little bit lazy on us during the week, so on Sunday mornings we like to give him just a little bit of exercise. You sure there's not somebody over here on this side now, because we need to run him both ways. Uh, Bob, it looks like that you're going to get a short trip today. Thank you. Our first song this morning is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great
Would you join with me? Let's pray together. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we're humbled that we can bow our heads before you at this time and thank thee for life and for all that you've blessed us with. We thank thee, Father, for those that you surround us with, for, for our friends and family, for those loved ones, that, that those people that love us and that we love. Father, for the ability to work with our hands, provide for those that we care about and for the work here at South Trail, we're thankful for that. We're thankful that you bless us with such a wonderful creation that we can live in and see your handiwork everywhere around us and know that you're there providing for us each and every day. We're thankful for all those things. We're thankful for forgiveness, Father, and for the peace that it brings about in each of our lives, Father, when we realize that you provided that for us also. We're mindful of uh, those that are of our number and uh, that are sick, and experiencing health issues. As we sit here, Father, this morning, each one of us has someone on our mind that has a, a problem with their health, with their finances, with uh, relationship issues, Father. We know that you know each person and each need and we pray father that you would bless each one according to their need according to your will for their lives we pray father that you'd open our eyes to the need that we might be a blessing to them in some small way we're thankful our father for the country that we live in we realize that we have problems as a nation and that we struggle from time to time and we pray that you bless our leaders that you would put your word before their eyes that they would see the importance of it, Father, that you would give us strength to stand up, Father, and speak the truth to power. <clears throat> We're mindful, our Father, uh, for the leadership of the congregation here at South Trail. We pray a special blessing uh, for Scott and for Ed and for Doug in their position and their role, uh, Father, as elders and shepherds. Pray that you care for them and provide them good health and wisdom to, do, to carry on that task. We're mindful of the work of, of Craig and, and pray that you bless him in those things that he's involved with. Pray that you bless Terry in, in his efforts this morning to present the word to us. Pray that you give him the words that he desires to speak the, the words from your word, Father, as you bless it in our hearing and bless our understanding of it, our willingness to obey it, to put it into practice in our lives. We're mindful, our Father, of uh, our weaknesses, those things that tempt us each and every day. Pray that you'd be patient with us as we try to overcome those things and to grow our faith, and that we would recognize, Father, you provide grace for us if we'll but ask for it. We're thankful, our Father, for those that have come before us, those we read about in your word. We pray that you would help us to see those things, that we, we, we might see also that your promises uh, for them were fulfilled and that we can rely on those promises for us will be but just faithful to you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who would like to, you can stand for this song. It's sort of hard for us to march, sit it down, or walk the golden streets.
He loves me. Church. Good morning. We now have the honor and privilege to take the Lord's Supper. You know, recently I heard of a story that I'd like to share with you this morning. It's the story's about a, a famous painting called The Last Supper. I'm sure you've all seen it or heard about it. And it was painted by a noted Italian artist named Leonardo da Vinci. And at the time, it took him, when he began, seven years to complete. And the figures representing the twelve apostles in Christ himself were painted from living people. He wouldn't have it any other way. Having said that, when, he, when it was decided that he would put this great picture together. Hundreds and hundreds of young men were carefully viewed in the endeavor to find a face and personality exhibiting innocence and beauty, free from the scars and signs of dissipation of sin. He was trying to find the first one, Jesus, that would depict his picture. Finally, after weeks of laborious search, a young man, 19 years of age, was selected as the model for Jesus in the portrayal of Christ. And for six months, Da Vinci worked on the production of this leading character of his famous painting. And then during the next six years, the same continued with fitting persons by persons for the chosen 11. Yes, I said 11 apostles. He, he set aside the twelfth to be done last, and that was Judas Iscariot. And why? Because Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. We all know that for, what, 30 pieces of silver. So when it came time to do Judas, he searched and searched for a man with a hard, callous face, with a countenance marked by scars of deceit, hypocrisy, 
a crime, a face of crime, and a de delineated character that would betray his friend. And after many discouraging experiences in searching for this type of person required to represent Judas, it came, word came to Da Vinci that the man who he was looking for was found in a prison in Rome. So Da Vinci made this trip to Rome and when the prisoner was brought out from the dungeon, he looked upon his face and he saw a dark, swarthy man and long, shaggy, unkept hair covering his face, which betrayed a character of viciousness and complete ruin. And at last the painter said, this is the one that would represent Judas. So getting granted permission from the king, he was able to take the prisoner to Milan where the picture was to be painted. And for months, this prisoner sat before Da Vinci, hours each day, as the gifted artist continued on with his painting. And as he finished his last stroke, he turned to the guard and said, I have finished, you may take the prisoner away. And as the guards were leading the prisoner away, he suddenly broke loose from their control and ran to Da Vinci crying. Oh, Da Vinci, look at me. Do you not know who I am? Da Vinci, with the trained eyes of a great character student, carefully scrutinized this man who he had been gazing upon for six months. And he says, no, I've never seen you in my life until you were brought before me out of the dungeons in Rome. Then the, lift, then the man, lifting his eyes to heaven, said, oh God, have I fallen so low? Turning his face to the painter, he cried, once again, Leonardo da Vinci, look at me again. I am the same man you painted just seven years ago as the figure of Christ. Here we have a young man whose character was so pure, so unspoiled by the sins of the world, that he represented a, a continence of innocence and beauty to be fit to, use, to be used for the painting and the representation of Christ. But just within a few short years, following the thoughts of sin and the life of crime, he was changed into a perfect picture of the most traitorous character ever known in the history of the world. So as we partake and as we begin to think about our lives, we know that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us, and I've heard it said, if you want to become sinless, then you must sin less. I know it's a hard thing to do, but we need to become like Jesus, and we need to remember Jesus. When he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, he told us instructions on how to do it. And Paul reiterated it in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And he tells us not once but twice to remember the Lord. And he ends in verse 26 saying, let us remember and proclaim his death. So at this time, as we go to remember the Lord, let's strive to remember him for the sacrifice that he made for us. He took our place. And let's strive to be that individual whose character is so pure and unspoiled by the ways of sin. Would you go with me to God in prayers? We give thanks for the bread which represents the body that Jesus sacrificed on our behalf. Pray with me. Almighty God, Father, we love you and we thank you so much for all that you do. We praise you, God, for Jesus and the sacrifice he made on our behalf. We pray as we partake of this bread which represents his body that we may do so in a manner pleasing to you and that may we, we may bring you honor and glory at this very hour. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer and give thanks for the cup. Father in heaven, God, we come before your throne of grace and mercy yet again, thanking you for the awesome God that you are. 
We pray as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf, that we may do so in a manner pleasing to you, and that we will be made clean, pure, and white as snow, Father, and live a life worthy of your calling. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. With the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, we now have the opportunity to give back. Just as the Lord's Supper was to be taken on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7, the, the, the apostles came together to break bread. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, now Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. We have this opportunity now to give back to the Lord, to further his work here on the king, uh, to further the work of the kingdom here on earth. So, as we're prepared to give... Let's go to God in prayer and thank him for the generous gifts that he gives us daily. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, God, we love you and we come before your throne to thank you for the, for the way that you prosper us, for the way that you provide and take care of us. And at this time as we're preparing to give, we pray that we may give joyfully and not grudgingly, but that we may uh, truly wish to help others we may truly wish to provide for the church to see the borders of its kingdom grow here on earth and father we pray that these funds may be used in a way in a manner that will be pleasing to you and father we just pray that you continue to bless us daily for this we ask and pray and give thanks in jesus name amen at your convenience there's collection plates at each of the entrances, and if you feel necessary, there's a way to text if you're not available. Thank you.
mansions over a hilltop. We are song for the reading of the prayer and scripture. If you'd like to stand for the singing of this song, remain standing during the reading of the scripture. Our scripture reading today is from Revelation, chapter 22, verses 12 through 17. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, the reading is found on page 1,426. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You may be seated. What a beautiful day it is, and we are so thankful for the presence of each and every one. If this is your first time as a guest here at South Trail, we are honored that you have come to worship with us. We hope that you will find us friendly and uh, practicing those things that are in Scripture. We hope that you'll come back and worship with us at every opportunity again. If we say or do anything that causes you to have a question, we would love for you to ask what it is that we believe and, and why and why we practice the things that we do. Uh, hopefully we can open the Bible and share that uh, with you together. We're so glad that everyone's here, and so again, we appreciate that. If you have a bulletin, you may want to open that to the second page. There is an outline that will help you as you follow along. Uh, might just keep you awake during the lesson today. I want to share with you some paradoxes, all right? You know what a paradox is, some things that are kind of opposite or, or maybe uh, don't sound like they go together. Uh, and here's some paradoxes about Aging. How many of y'all have been aging since yesterday? All right. 
Here's one that Andy Rooney said, it's paradoxical that the idea of living a long life appeals to everyone, but the idea of getting old doesn't appeal to anyone. That's too true. It's just, that's almost too true. The older I get, the better I used to be. Lee Trevino said that. I see that every day in the mirror. At age 20, we worry about what others think of us. At age 40, we don't care what they think of us. At age 60, we discover they haven't been thinking of us at all. <laughs> George Burns said, when I was young, I was called a rugged individualist. When I was in my 50s, I was considered eccentric. Here I, here I am doing and saying the same things I did then, and now I'm labeled senile. The important thing to remember is that I'm probably going to forget. Here's one by C.S. Lewis. We must recognize that as we grow older, we become like old cars. More and more repairs and replacements are necessary. Here's one. Old age is like flying a plane through a storm. Once you are aboard, there is nothing you can do about it. As we begin today, I want you to be praying about the Sarasota County Fair booth. We've had a wonderful couple of days to meet some of our neighbors and make friends. The people who work there, we do have a requirement. You have to smile if you're going to work at the fair booth. You've got to try to make a, a positive impression and influence people. And so far, we have really enjoyed getting to know some of our neighbors. We look forward to the next eight days to be able to continue that. And I appreciate all those who have volunteered to work at the fair. And I also have one more prayer request. Doug and Craig are out of the country. They went to visit one of our missionaries in Nicaragua. And so pray for them to have a safe return. Uh, as they come home to us. And that, that request came especially from Vanessa. I'm sure Jana would have seconded that, but uh, Vanessa needs her husband back. Those four boys are a lot to handle with Craig gone. And so I think probably we should say an extra prayer for Vanessa as well uh, when Craig uh, and Doug are gone as well. How do you experience life? Isn't life more than just what happens to us? As you experience life, is your life full? Are you experiencing life in a way that you say, hey, this is great, and every day gets better? Forget those paradoxes about getting older. The fact is that as you experience life, there are things that ought to give us joy. There are experiences and memories, the ones we can keep, that we ought to be able to thrive with those things in life. The relationships that we have should cause us to be able to feel and experience life even more. In Psalm chapter 8, in the 8th Psalm, listen to what the psalmist said as he thought about all that God has created. He said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. God has made us with glory and honor. He has intended us to be able to experience life in all of the grandeur. When we look through a telescope, we see the macro. That is, we see just how vast and large the universe is. When we look in a microscope, we see the detail and, and the smallness of what God has made. His creation is not one-dimensional. There is such a variety and diversity of what God has made that we should be in awe. We should be in amazement at what God has made and placed us to enjoy this universe. In knowing God, why does life have so many opportunities? As we have looked at this series, we talked about made in the image of God rationally, that is intellectually. And yet many people use their minds, it seems, to run away from God. For example, I've known some Christians who went off to college and they studied a thing called philosophy. You all ever heard of it? Philosophy? Trying to answer some of the basic questions of life and yet most philosophers have moved away from a faith in God and I want you to quickly understand why. You see, it's one thing to look at this world and to ask questions, but it is another thing to ask questions based on assumptions, 
false assumptions. For example, the idea that we can explain everything in the universe apart from God. When you look at this universe, you know it is not an accident. Believe me, I I've had an accident or two on the roadways. Uh, I don't want you to be scared, all right? I I'll warn you which way I go out the front, all right, getting on 41. But understand, accidents have a chaotic sense about them. This universe operates by laws. There are principles that are behind how the universe operates. It shouts that there is a designer, a creator, that everything was placed here by him on purpose. And that includes you. Last week we talked about made in the image of God morally. That is, we were made for relationships. And even our social relationships remind us of our need and our design of a relationship with God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But in that morality, there's a right and a wrong. And again, even without somebody telling you or giving you a list of rules, you just intuitively know that there's right and wrong. There is good and evil. And believe me, the evil at times looks like it's winning. But our God has promised that He will triumph in the end. And Jesus coming to earth is a testimony of how Jesus lived and how Jesus died and how He rose again. The resurrection is a testimony that God does win in the end. God will triumph. Good will overcome evil in the end. But that moral sense allows us to recognize our guilt and our need for grace. And God has provided that grace tremendously, powerfully, abundantly. The grace is available in Jesus Christ. We are made in the image of God. And if you look in your outline there, the first blank, we are made in the image of God rationally, morally, and spiritually. We are made in the image of God. The wise men said there in Ecclesiastes 3, 2, there's a time to be born and a time to die. The dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. That golden, that golden cord will be loosed. That cistern will be broken there in Ecclesiastes 12, 6. Our aging has a, a terminus. There is a time in which we will die. There's a book by Rob Mull called The Art of Dying. In it, he describes some of the robust rituals that people had back in the 18th century. Back in the 1700s, how people would spend weeks or months at the bedside of a loved one when they were nearing the end of their journey. He talked about the fact that people not only spent hours at the bedside, but then when someone passed, they put on their, their best clothes. They put on black clothes so that they could grieve. They would hold some sort of a wake in their front parlor, and people would come by, and, and they would spend time with people, not alone, as they began the process of, of going forward without someone who had been critical in their lives. And even when they went to worship, there at their buildings, beside, in front, somewhere attached to it, there would be a graveyard where there would be those who were buried. And even as they went to worship, there was a reminder with those markers and tombstones of loved ones who had gone before. They didn't hide the subject of death. But then Rob Mole talks about the fact that in the 20, 20th and 21st century, somehow we have tried to push death out of our mind. We don't even want people to talk about dying. They, we want to treat it like it's taboo, that it's something that we can just ignore and, and it maybe never happen. But death is a reality. And in fact, death is not something to be feared. It is not something to be evaded or ignored. It is something that should be embraced. Because the fact of the matter is, God made you for more. And if you only look at this life, and if you say, this life, 70, 80, 100 years, you say, that's all it is, then you have missed the biggest lesson of all. God has made you in His image, and He has made you spiritually. Because God wants you to experience more. It's not just this life. Our lives should be full, our lives can be full, but there is something that we must realize. 
in Revelation chapter 22 that Larry read for us a moment ago, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. According to what everyone has done, everyone's life, God intends for us to have a reward. There is something more. There is a blessing to be waited, uh, to anticipate it, to be something that we look forward to receiving, just like we do other gifts in life. There is a reward that Jesus has come. I want you to look at your outline. Number one, we are made for a sacred dignity. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, when God says He made us in His image, in the ancient world, when someone was made in the image of a king or a queen, that child was treated as royalty. In Genesis chapter 1, what God says is, you're related to me. I claim you. I created you for myself. You are intended to have fellowship and communion with God. And therefore, it's something that is exalted. It's something that is elevated. It's not something that makes life less worth living, but all the more. To know that we are made in the image of God. I want you to look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And there's a passage here that I believe we can relate to the creation. And it's lengthy, so look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. And I want to read down to verse 20. And I want you, as you, as you listen to this passage, think about what God was doing when He created Adam and Eve. The Apostle Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up, us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you think back in Genesis chapter 1, as God made Adam, remember he was naming all the animals, and there was no helper or helpmeet suitable for Adam. And then God caused Adam to fall asleep. He took a rib from his side. He fashioned woman. He brought the woman and brought Adam and Eve together. And when he brought them together, there was something that they knew. And I imagine it was almost immediate that they knew that as their bodies were brought together, that they experienced a fellowship or, or a union that was something beyond just physical. And what God said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus even recalled that and remembered it in Matthew chapter 19. That God had created them male and female. But I want you to think about this when it comes to what God intended in marriage. As God brought Adam and Eve together, they didn't even have to think about it. I, I mean, I don't believe Adam had to say, I do. I, I think Adam, if he said anything, he would have said, done. You know, and, and that's what happens when you get married. You're finished. Okay. <laughs> Understand, God brought them together and it completed them and, and they had a union. But when you can say yes, that means you can also say no. And that's what Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 6, is that we get to exercise the yes and the no. We get to make a moral decision about doing that is what is right and honoring God because there is in marriage the, the powerful spiritual reflection of how God intended for you and I to have a relationship with Him. Oh, it's spiritual. 
It's something beyond the physical. But it's something that is reflected in what we have in the intimacy, in the union of a husband and a wife. And if we miss the spiritual reflection, we're missing something. But just as we have the opportunity to say yes and no, we have the opportunity to exercise that power. And just like we can say no to, to a, a man or a woman about not marrying them, we get to say yes or no to God. We get to choose, will we have and, and will we fulfill that spiritual intention that God had for us to be with Him, or will we reflect and miss that? You see, in your outline, we are made for spiritual intimacy. That love that we talked about last week about morality, unless God is at the center, then love is not love. Love becomes very self-focused, very selfish. But if I keep God there, then I want the best for you as I know God wants the best for me. And love is allowing us to reflect that dignity, to be able to respect one another and treat each other the very best. You see... When we talk about what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 6, marriage is theological, not just biological. There is something there, a lesson for us. And I want you to look at your outlines. We are made as soulmates, not cellmates. Now, I know some of you all say, okay, Terry, you're, you're knocking marriage. No. The soulmates, I'm not talking about just marriage. I'm talking about that spiritual relationship with God. In fact, so many times people kind of lessen the idea of soulmates because your soul was designed for God. Can you understand that spiritually speaking, the highest and best yes in your life is to choose what God wants for you. To have the relationship that God wants for you. Yes, marriage is special. Yes, marriage is designed to, to help us to be able to have the relationship, the, the closeness to share, to fulfill to, to be able to reflect that spiritual relationship, but ultimately, your greatest choice is, will I belong to God? Will I say yes to God? And what Paul talks about there in verses 19 to 20 is being the temple of the Holy Spirit, allowing ourselves to be cleansed by the blood of Christ so that God's Spirit can dwell in us, and so our relationship can be fulfilling, and we can truly be God's. Where everything in our lives is centered around bringing glory to God, to try to glorify the God who has blessed us and given us so much. I want you to think about a, a quote that Pope John Paul said a few years ago, and just think about this because I think it's insightful. There is no dignity when the human dimension is eliminated from the person. In short, the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much of the person, but too little. That's a powerful statement, and at first when you hear that, you may say, well, wait a minute, pornography is, is exposure, and, and, and it's too much. But what he's saying is that when you think about your spiritual, the body is not the end, the spirit. And what we do in the body is something that reflects the direction, the choice of our spirit. Will we choose to love God as God has loved us? us. We sang that song before the Lord's Supper. He loves me. Yes. And John would say in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. We wouldn't know what love is. We wouldn't have any idea. But because we love God, guess what? When I see another human being hurting, I hurt. When I see another human being not choosing to live for God and denigrating their own life, their body, their spirit, I ache. I ache because I realize that we are all made in the image of God. We are intended for fellowship with God. Look at number two. We are given the body as the complement to your soul and spirit. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As Paul writes the conclusion, and he wraps this up to the church at Thessalonica, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Body, soul, and spirit. 
You see, the body is the container. This is the package for our soul and our spirit. The body is not what's most important. It's interesting that back in the Greeks, Plato came up with the idea of dualism, and he said that all matter is evil, and all spiritual or soulful is good. The Bible doesn't speak of it that way, because what the Bible speaks of is that the body is going to act as the soul or the spirit should be directed. If we have chosen to say yes to God, then all of a sudden, how are we going to act with our body? We're going to do those things that God wants us to. We're going to want to serve Him. Things that are reflective to give God glory. Again, Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body, but not the soul. Fear the one who can kill or destroy both body and soul in hell. Again, you are meant for more. So if you're looking at this life and you're not living for the next life, you're falling short. You're coming up short of what your potential is. Because God wants you to think about eternity. He wants you with Him. How many of y'all have ever gone to a sporting event? How many of y'all are, are fans? Or as Gwen says about me, I'm a fanatic. All right. How many of y'all have ever acted like a fan? If you go to a, a stadium, and I know last night you know, several teams won, and and some teams lost. I know several people this morning were telling me that Arkansas won. All right? You know, even Tim Story was saying Arkansas won. I said, Tim, you're always talking about Michigan. He said, but I was rejoicing with Arkansas last night. All right. But here's what happens. When you're watching a game and something happens that you like, your team scores, your team wins, you, what do you do? You throw your arms in there, you jump up. You know what you're doing? You're expanding. All right? You're expanding. You throw your hands up. You give somebody a high five. You know, you're pumping your fists in the air. You're expanding your body. But what about your spirit? When we come to worship, how many of you, as you're sitting there, and, and I'm not talking about jumping around or anything. I'm talking about just inside you, as you praise God, as we sing these songs, as we talk about God being our creator, the giver of life and every good gift. When we think about God, how many of that causes you, your spirit, to expand? See, Jesus said, God is the Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And when you're worshiping God in spirit, the inside is just expanding. You're full of the thought. You're full of the, the, the faith in God. Our God is great. Our God is good all the time. God is faithful. God keeps His promises, and God wants us to be filled with those things that are spiritual, so we appreciate God. If you get full on Sunday, let me tell you something, you're not going to be empty on Monday. If you get full on Sunday, you're not going to be empty on Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday. You're going to be full of God. You're going to love Him, and you're going to say, God, what can I do to serve you today? See, my body is a complement of my soul and my spirit. I'm going to let my body, my hands, my feet, my mouth, put into action what my spirit and soul want to do to love my God. And I'm not going to look at it and say, do I have to sign up for the Sarasota County Fair booth? I'm going to say, you know what? If I get to represent God, I'm in. If I get to tell other people that I love my God and God is great, I'm in. I, I, we're not going to have to beg people to teach the children about loving God because you know what? Your spirit should be so full, you can't wait to share it with everyone. Sometimes we're afraid of teaching because we don't have all the answers. Have you seen me? I do not have all the answers. I've been studying a long time and I want to keep on studying and I want to share all that I know. But I will tell you this, if you're intimidated because you don't have all the answers, you're looking at it in the wrong direction. Have you heard of God? Have you heard of God's love? Have you heard of Jesus Christ? Have you heard that God has shared with us and revealed to us the things He wants us to know? That's where the blessing is. Don't look at it and say, well, what do I not know? No, what I do know is more than enough to fill my spirit with what God wants me to share with others. I want you to look at, in the outline there, I've taken the three parables from Matthew 25, and I don't have any time to really share what I wanted to share, but we all have an opportunity. There are the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. They took extra oil. Guess what? We all have opportunities. We all have opportunities. 
we all have the things that God has given to us, and we need to be using it. The second parable that Jesus told in Matthew 25 is about the parable of the talents. And there were three different individuals. He gave five talents to one, two to another, and one to another. The five and the two both doubled. They used what they had. Guess what? We all have obligation. We all have different gifts. Read Romans 12, 4 through uh, 8, and you'll see the different gifts that God gives to some of us, and those gifts need to be used. They were unequal. It doesn't matter if your gifts are more than mine. Your gifts are different than mine. I'm supposed to use what I have, where I am, to be able to serve God. Thirdly, by the way, the five talent and the two talent were told, both told, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful over a few things, I will make you Lord over many things. Enter into the joys prepared for you by your master. Well done. We have opportunities. We have an obligation. We all have options. If you look at the third parable that Jesus told, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, the parable of the sheep and the goats, it says, well, you know, when, when I saw somebody who was hungry, I served them. When I saw somebody who was thirsty, I gave them a drink. When I saw somebody who was sick, I, I helped them. When I visited someone who was alone, somebody who was in prison, a stranger, I took them in. All of those things. And, and then they say, well, when did we see you, Lord, when you were hungry, when you were thirsty, when you were, were sick, when you were in prison? When you were naked or a stranger. And Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. You see, the spiritual obligation is not to see people in their bodily form and just to stop there. The key thing is to see that they're made in the image of God. And they're made with a sacred dignity and they need to have that. And if you look at what we see, if you see Jesus, if you see God's imprint in that person that you're looking at, then you're beginning to think the way God wants you to think. You're beginning to see what God wants you to see. The final point on your outline, we are made to trust God's promise of a forever home. I need to choose to trust God. God tells me what to do, but will I trust Him? Will I do it? Or will I say, oh, that's not me. That, that's not my responsibility. That's the preacher. That's the elders. That's somebody else, anybody else but me. There in Revelation chapter 22, in verse 17, again, what we read this morning, he said, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. What we would tell you today is that spiritually speaking, it's available. The eternal life, the full life, the, the capacity to have your spirit filled with what God intended for you, it's there. You can drink from the truth, drink from the, the, the things that God has provided. Trust God. He wants you with Him in His forever home. There was a Christian lady. Her special gift was baking. And she baked. She baked breads, she baked pies, she baked all kinds of things. And she shared those with people when they were sick, when they were shut in, when they were bereaved. She shared those things. And she told people how much she loved God. And she shared th with them what God had done in her life. And she invited people to learn more about God. And others taught those people. And there were many, many who received spiritual blessings, who received salvation because of her invitation. But if you ask this woman whose gift was baking, if you said, now are you evangelistic? She would have ducked her head and said, oh no, that's not me. That, that's somebody else. Let me ask you a question. When she used what God gave her, where she was with the opportunities that were all around her, was she sharing the good news? Absolutely. You may look at your life and say, well, I, I'm not going to be a preacher. I, I'm not going to be able to just sit there and just, just pour over the scriptures with somebody else. But let me ask you this. Has God given you anything? Do you love God? You, have you received the love of God? Do you recognize the blessings that God has filled your spirit to expand you? To help you to see something more. Something beyond. This life. Into eternity. God wants you to give Him glory by using what He's given you. You don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to pretend to have something you don't have. 
All you have to do is let God use you where you are with what you have and love him. This morning, if you've never obeyed the gospel, what a wonderful opportunity. Your spirit will, will begin expanding the moment that you say yes to what God promises. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We didn't come up with the idea of baptism as something that God intended. It's a beautiful reenactment of the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. If you've never done that, we would encourage you to take that step. Obey what God says for you to do as you believe in Christ, as you repent of your sins, and as you put on Christ to become a new person, a new creation. If you are a Christian today and you realize in your life you, you've taken off a different route and you need to get back on the path so that you can have that spiritual walk with God so that God can fill you and allow you to be a light and a reflection of Him into the lives of the people around you. We encourage you to, to make whatever is wrong right. If we can encourage you and pray with you and help you, help you along your way, we encourage that as well. Whatever your need might be, the bride and the spirit say come. Come now. While we stand it, while we sing. Following the prayer, just a couple of brief announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. So if you would, please bow with me now. We'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for the privilege to come before you in the name of Jesus and ask you in his name to forgive us of our sins, that our prayers may be heard. We thank you for the privilege to be part of such a diverse creation and to have a personal relationship with you as the perfect designer. And we thank you for the reciprocal desire to feed 
this special relationship. Thank you for making us in your image, rationally, morally, and spiritually. Please bless our efforts to maintain this image properly as we thank you for empowering us to overcome any fear of death and blessing us with true purpose of life, our sacred dignity, our spiritual intimacy to be proper with you and your family here, that we may all remain soulmates as yours and yours alone. Please help us focus all our choices to reflect our love for you and you alone. Father, we ask you to bless our efforts to properly maintain our body, soul, and spirit. Help us recognize our opportunities, our obligations, our options, and to act accordingly to your grace that your grace may abound. Help us to trust you more. And Father, be with our missionaries. Please bring Doug and Craig back safely. Be with the first responders, healthcare workers, our service men and women home and overseas. And Father, those of us working at the fair, for it to be successful in growing your family here, and Father, surround us with your protective forces as we go from here with your word to an unfriendly world that you would bring us back safely for Bible study on Wednesday night. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For everybody that's here, especially those of you that are visiting, we really are grateful that you're here. If you haven't taken the time already to fill out a visitor card, please do so now. And uh, you can just drop them in the trays on the way out or just leave it in the pew and we'll pick it up uh, later on. And we invite you back again for our uh, next meeting on Wednesday night at 7 for